Comics. I'm your host, Brian Hines, and we're going to be doing some quickie comic book reviews for January of 2023. The first reviews of the year. But first, oh hey everyone, real quick, be sure to like this video, subscribe to my channel, click the notification bells, and also check out my Patreon page. Why? Well, that's the first place you get to see these videos, but of course there's something extra. Remember these? The Last Angry Geek DVDs. They're now all out of print. But you can still see the videos because once a month I'm going to be uploading a Patreon exclusive video, one of the video reviews or riffs on these DVDs. The first two riffs on The Last Angry Geek Volume 1 are already on the Patreon page. Every month you're going to get an exclusive video. You don't have to pay for it. As long as you're subscribed, you can watch it. Uh, we've got the first appearance of Captain Marvel gets a review in this first one. Uh, the first appearance of Mary Marvel gets a review on this one. Uh, very timely because the second Shazam movie's coming out. There's also a, a romance comic I review, a horror comic. There's a special short box of the inane episode that I'm probably going to put up in October. Who doesn't love The Last Angry Ghoulie? And I've got an entire DVD of riffs. There's a, okay, there's a lot of geek riffs that you're going to get with this deal, but I've got like nine riffs across three DVDs. I can't help it. You're getting a lot of riffs, but there's also a lot of reviews. So like two-thirds riffs. One third reviews, but be honest, most of you like the riffs more than my reviews anyway, right? So if you subscribe to my Patreon page, once every month you're going to get a free video that's exclusive to the Patreon from the Last Angry Geek DVD collection. If you already have the DVDs, I'm sorry, but you know, now you can throw them away because they're going to be available digitally. For as little as a dollar, you can see these videos. And hey, if you, at the higher levels, you get great stuff too. You, get, uh, you all get early access to the videos. Everyone gets that. You could get me to do a drawing for you. You could get me to review a comic you like. You could get your name in the credits. So check out the Patreon page. There's a lot of cool things you can pledge for, but uh, I gotta get back to the review, so thanks. Thank you. So first up, it's Little Monsters number 9. This is an image comics book about a group of children who live alone in a city. Written by Jeff Lemire and drawn by Dustin Nugent. The big secret? Well, it's not really a secret. They're all vampires. And they haven't seen an adult vampire in decades, maybe even centuries. They play their games, they feed on rats, growing more and more bored of their never-ending existence. They were told to remain in this empty city to never leave and to never feed on humans, but that all changes when an actual human wanders into the city. One of the children breaks his elders' rules and feeds on him, experiencing a rush like he's never felt. From there it becomes a civil war as the children fall into two camps, one trying to feed on the new humans and the other trying to protect them and follow the rules set by their long-missing elders. Previous issues have given us flashbacks of their encounters with the elder vampire who turned them into vampires. As of issue 9, the pro-human camp is trying to protect a young girl named Laura from the feeder camp. The book is done entirely in grey tones and Nugent really does a great job with facial expression. We see the fear on their faces as their structured and understood world comes crashing down around them. The anger and rage as they betray and are betrayed themselves by their friends. We're still no closer to understanding why they live the way they do. We're still no closer to understanding why they live the way they do. But the pro-human camp is getting close to answers when they finally question Romy, the mute boy who is the oldest of vampire children and has been acting on the instructions of the Elder all along. This is a horror book, but I wouldn't call it scary, as our monsters are all children. There are some moments of gore and violence, though, which I do think qualify this book for the horror classification. Now, I'm not sure how long this book is supposed to last, but if you do want to read it, start with issue one. Should you read it? Well, we've had nine issues with precious little answers, but I'm still into it. It's not a highly engrossing title, but it's moody and lives on atmosphere. It's got good art, and if you like a splash of mystery in your vampire story, then this is the book for you. Next up is Archie vs. the World number 1. It's Archie set in the apocalypse. An elderly jughead tells the tale of how he and his best friend Archie drove around the wasteland in his old jalopy. Archie, a man of destiny, encounters witches and a former rival now wearing a mask. He falls in love with three different women who offer him three different destinies. There's also a pretty boss rock band that dresses up as cats. A little quick backstory. There was a comic book called The Best Archie Comic Ever, and there was a segment in that called Jughead the Burger Aryan, or Burger Barian, or something like that. It was written by Aubrey Sitterson and drawn by Jed Doherty, who are also the creative team on the Dark Horse comic book Savage Hearts. Archie Comics liked what they did so much that they gave him this one shot, and that's kind of the problem. It's only a one shot. See, I'm a big fan of Doherty's art. He draws really hyper-muscular characters and handles action scenes very well, but there's no story here. This whole comic reads like a movie trailer. When I first heard about this comic, I thought, oh great, that sounds like a cool miniseries, but it's not. It's a one-shot. Not even a super-sized one-shot. It's only 20 pages. We get scenes of Archie taking on his rival, who then unmasks and reveals his identity. We get a scene of Archie asking Betty to help him save Veronica from the raiders in the wasteland. We get a scene of Sabrina in her three different forms, crone, maiden, child, giving him a prophecy. Although we never learn what that prophecy is. These scenes all feel unconnected. 
The only thing connecting them seems to be this wasteland city. There's no start or finish. We're just glimpsing scenes as they happen. Yes, Veronica is kidnapped. Yes, they rescue her at the end, but it doesn't feel like there's a solid narrative from start to finish. I can only recommend this comic if you like the art. Honestly, this was a mini-series shoved into a 20-page one-shot, and that's another of Archie's increasingly baffling decisions in regards to their comic books. Sins of Sinister. So, when the mutants founded Krakoa, the former evil mutants were all given amnesty and told to play nice. People like Magneto, Mystique, and Apocalypse all held ruling positions on the council, but also so did Mr. Sinister. But Sinister doesn't play well with others. Using clothes on Myra McTaggart to access her power to reset history, Sinister has spent several realities trying to kill the ex mutant messiah, Hope Summers. He finally kills her as well as the White Queen, Professor X, and Exodus, and when those four are resurrected, they now have Sinister's diamond on their forehead. They are Mr. Sinister. It seems Hope's power was interfering with his ability to write his own genetic code into all the clones being brought back to life. Now, every resurrectory is sinister. They're not exactly under his control, but they all share his ambitions and desires. Thus begins the Sin of Sinister event by Kieran Gillen and Lucas Wernick. We begin jumping forward in time as mutantkind offers resurrections to humanity, thus more and more normal people become sinister. Dissenters are silenced. The Avengers are manipulated into striking against anti-mutant enemies. Then to make sure Earth is safe for his machinations, he strikes out at other villains. He fires the Juggernaut through space as a living bullet to kill Thanos. Doctor Doom and the Fantastic Four are killed and replaced with clones. Eventually, the Eternals and Avengers are all murdered. But cracks in the plan appear when Storm evades their control, going underground with Mystique and Destiny. When the original Mr. Sinister worries his followers are a little too independent, he returns to his lab to start over, but finds all of his Moira clones are gone. He's stuck in this timeline. Now, it seems like the X-Men are always given the alternate reality stories. Days of Future Past, Age of X. I'm interested enough in this one because it revolves around a villain, not unlike the Age of Apocalypse. That said, Kieran Gillen first wrote Mr. Sinister back in Uncanny X-Men maybe a decade ago, and he was the first one to create this kind of campy Sinister, and I'm not a fan of that version of the character. I prefer the quiet, unemotional villains, but I realize that's something of a stereotype for villains. Honestly, they've been using this camp, Mr. Sinister, since the X-Men reboot under Jonathan Hickman, and I'm just not a fan, but that's a me problem, not a you problem. This is a minor quibble of mine and probably not going to affect my enjoyment of the series as a whole. From what I'm seeing, it looks like it's going to be fun. A lot of, you know, sinister versions of the X-Men. That said, this is another one of the famous X-Men cash grabs when they put an alternate reality out there, and then all of a sudden, here's eight or nine miniseries set in that reality. Go buy them all. You don't need to. Most of them are going to suck, let's be honest. Just read the main miniseries if you want to know what's going on. And finally, we have Scarlet Witch number one, a brand new comic by Steve Orlando and Sarah Pacelli, setting up a new status quo for Wanda Maximoff, who's not been part of the comic book Avengers for some time. Mostly she's been teaching classes over at Strange Academy. Now she's running a shop in New York. She's also stopping Dr. Hydro and his kaiju from destroying a ship. Her shop sells trinkets, baubles, books, but she also has a very special door in it. She gets a visit from her brother Quicksilver and introduces Pietro to her new assistant, Darcy. Hmm. A sarcastic white girl in a beanie. Familiar. She explains about the door. It's called the Last Door, and it's a magical door that will bring people to her when they're at their lowest. A woman then walks through the door and explains that her entire village has been taken over by a minor league mind control villain named the Corruptor. Wanda, as the Scarlet Witch, faces off with him, being forced to relive many of her past mistakes. She saves the day, but as Darcy and she close up the shop, someone else comes through the door. Her ex-husband's daughter, Viv Vision. So we've just gotten the 616 version of Darcy from the Thor films and most recently WandaVision. That said, I really would not have expected her to show up in a Scarlet Witch title. I mean, she never even interacted with Wanda in WandaVision. I'd expect her to be in whatever Jane Foster book is currently out there. Valkyrie, I think. That said, we've got a formula for Wanda that works. A person at their lowest point walks through that door, she helps him. And at this point in continuity, they've simplified her powers from her mutant days. Gone are the probability-altering hexes. Now she uses actual magic. So she turns a bad guy to stone, teleports another to a separate dimension. And the entrance of Viv at the end is intriguing. She says Viv is the closest thing she has to do with daughter, and I won't spoil Tom King's Vision series, but... Yeah, that's kind of true. Sarah Pacelli has a very elegant, kind of European style to her art. Tall, lanky figures with very subtle expression work. I've been a fan of hers for years since she was doing Ultimate Spider-Man with Brian Bendis. This feels like a fresh start for the Scarlet Witch. Uh, I'm intrigued by the cast she's got around her, basically just Darcy. But that she'll probably be interacting with her friends and families. Uh, even in the second issue, there's a short backstory where she meets up with Storm. 
this is a fresh start for Wanda, and it feels good. It feels it gives her a kind of an adventure of the week formula, but it also gives uh, ongoing stories like this magic trinket she's found that resists magic. Why is Darcy there? What's her purpose in the story? And we're also going to have guest stars from her family and former teammates, like uh, her brother, her not-quite-stepdaughter. So I'm sure there'll be plenty of ongoing Marvel continuity in her solo title. This book could be a sleeper hit, but I kind of got the feeling it'll be one of those good-but-overlooked books that gets cancelled after 12 issues. Scarlet Witch isn't a hugely popular character, even with her appearances in the MCU. But maybe I'm wrong, and this book will be great, and this is your chance to get in on the ground floor. Okay, my friends, thank you for joining me. Wow, four comics. Woo! Okay, thank you for joining me. Be sure to check back here next time for our reviews of February 2023. Until then, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, check out my Patreon page, click the bell for notifications, wave hi to your neighbor, pet a dog on the head, and whatever else you'd feel like you need to do. Until next time, my friends, this is Brian Reads Comics, and I'm your host, Brian Hines.